Hello, welcome to Fold Talks. This is Nourishing the Roots. Um, I'm Lois Brown. I'm a regular here at Fold, um, on Fold, and I've been coming to this club since 2018. First event was Bubba Stilts. Um, the reason why I titled it Nourishing the Roots is because, as we all know, dance music, a lot of it came from black culture. It came from Detroit, it came from New York, it came from Chicago. And as we know, especially in the techno scene, it's very whitewashed, and gen I mean, generally across the board. And I organized this so panel so we could, I also say curate, curated this panel so we could uh, discuss this some more um, with some people that I know will definitely have the knowledge and have the capacity to talk about this in depth. Um, and I've got an amazing group of people on this panel. I'm so stoked to have everyone here. Um, so I want to introduce to you Charles Alesso Neku, uh, also known as DJ Wingold um, from Unbound Events. We've got Nix, who's also a DJ, co-founder of Black Artist Database, and we've got Jordan Hall Pike from Black Music Summit. And now I'm going to pass it over to the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Charles. Hi, I'm Charles, uh, also known as DJ Wingold. Uh, so as Lewis said, uh, I run a party or an events platform uh, in London called Unbound Events. It's been going for five years. Um, as part of the overall structure, uh, we have a radio show. Um, we also elevate minorities through a number of things. Uh, so I take part in a lot of panels and discussions such as these. Uh, I also do a lot of writing uh, and speaking uh, about minority representation, the history of music culture, uh, and also mental health and other social awareness issues. Nice. My name is Nix, and I'm one of the co-founders of BAD, Black Artist Database, which was formerly known as Black Bandcamp. This was launched in June 2020 with a group of friends and I. It started out as a spreadsheet and has now grown into a database of 4,500 creatives and artists from the global diaspora. I'm also a DJ, um, working mainly in UK and Western Europe. A speaker, so similar to Charles, I speak on a lot of panels, and I'm actually a contemporary trained dancer. Which I just is found it out recently, which I was not aware of. I was like, "Whoa!" Yeah, we so were dancing I, on many floors together, and I didn't. I was like, "Yes." So <laughs> that's a bit about me. Uh, hi, I'm Jordan. Um, I'm an agent at WME. Um, I'm also the co-founder of a new project that we've been working on called the Black Music Summit. Um, my background is a promoter. Um, I kind of paid my way through university through throwing parties, like I'm sure a lot of people did. Um, and then found myself in Ibiza the year after I graduated, thought it would be like one summer of fun. And I didn't leave for like 12 years. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, that's uh, extended. So yeah, that's my story and, uh, and yeah, delighted to be here. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, where, do we, where do we start? I feel like there's so many different subjects we could start on, but um, I feel, I think a really, a really good po starting point would be talking about like inclusivity uh, and diversity riders. Um, one of my things has been, I was reading a piece um, from Pirate Studios that they did some, uh, they had done a research into, into this and they found only 7% 7, 7 of artists have diversity riders, which I thought was quite, and this is from like June last year, so it might have increased since then. But I kind of want to get your perspectives on what you thought about them. Also, for me personally, I know artists that do have them, again, are from minority backgrounds. But how do we, you know, push this out? How do we encourage more people to not just make it a niche, you know, the people who are already in those groups, but it make them go beyond those groups? I can go first. Okay. Uh, so I think they are a useful tool. Um, like. Funnily enough, a lot of the artists I know that have them actually tend to be like the bigger white artists. Okay. Uh, and I think it's beneficial. Um, my issue with them is whether they're actually policed and when they're used, if they lead to tokenism. So for example, say a big artist says they must have two people of color and like one woman, for example, but it doesn't really specify the genre. So a promoter who sees that might then put someone on, but it doesn't really fit the lineup yeah and that makes mm. it kind of counterintuitive because then you'll get a night that doesn't really gel um and then on top of that in terms of the policing i think if no one is really like enforcing it how do we ensure that this actually like follows through um so i think it's like a useful tool in the arsenal but i think there are like wider ways to ensure that minorities are included on lineups mm. that's like one thought yeah cool. yeah i think they're an important part of like an artist rider to have it's definitely a step in the right direction compared to like pre-pandemic mm -hmm. where 
people, it wasn't even on people's minds. So at least it's now yeah. on more people's minds. For me, what I think is important is that not only are we saying, okay, I have to have X amount of this demographic on there, but are these people being paid correctly? Truth, because the amount of truth. lineups that mm -hmm. I know that they've added a black woman or a non-binary person or a queer person, and the way the budget has been split between the headliner and them is not equal, that also needs to be policed. So it's one thing to say, you know, as a white heterosexual male, and I similarly, a lot of the people that I know that have added riders are actually the kind of tier one white heterosexual cis males, but it's about making sure that they're not taking up 90% of the budget and then splitting mm. the 10% between the other three, because this is what mm. happens a lot of the time. It's, it, then that just doesn't actually, you know, address the issue because for them, it's like I've ticked a box, my lineup yeah. that I've created has and X, Y, and Z. Still... But actually the issue is, is like resources and money at the end of the day and finances. Mm. If these support acts are still being paid nothing compared to that person, then it doesn't really change anything. Mm. Mm. They're getting exposure and the person at the top gets the kind of Lunch. well done yeah. Yeah. you brought on these people but I know a lot of I've had to turn down myself a lot of um requests and it's just like no and also to Charles's point this year alone I've turned down four mm -hmm. where it's like have you listened to what I play mm -hmm. yeah. me and this person mm -hmm. do not align sonically yeah. mm -hmm. so I think it's mm -hmm. just about being really careful that we're not just doing it for the sake of it it's like is there a sonic fit are we gonna ensure we're paying everyone like what they deserving mm. that deserve to pay I understand there is a hierarchy in this but yeah yeah i, th I think from a, like a a promoter's perspective i th feel like it's like a it's a two-way relationship like mm. there's the rider that's on there that obviously has been put forward by the artist but it really needs to be like adopted by the promoter as part of their toolkit to create that lineup mm -hmm. it's it's not yeah. just something that is an afterthought, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that it's a lot of promoters' responsibilities to actually take that and take that creatively. So it's not like I have to put a person of colour on the lineup or I have to put a woman yeah. on the lineup. I have the opportunity because of this rider that's been put forward to me mm -hmm. to be creative and sonically mm -hmm. build a lineup around it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I feel like it's not just, you know, it's not just the responsibility of the artist, it's also responsibility of the, the, of the promoters yeah. and the curators that are putting those lineups together. Yeah. And following on from what both of you said, I think, yeah, there's definitely a way that it can come across as almost gimmicky. So like, yeah. I think the ecosystem has to work together to like really want to make it work. But with big artists, they can say, okay, I've done my bit. I'm socially conscious. And obviously the industry is very <laughs> image-focused, yeah. very virtue signaling. So they're like, cool, yeah. I've done my bit. I like look so good. I'm supporting artists. But if the resources don't go, and if it doesn't really make sense, then like, how is it going to help anyone? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think there's nuances to that rider as well that can probably be just developed over time. Because 100%. obviously in, like, in the film industry, there's been these riders since the 70s, since the 80s, and people have probably developed them with, with various mm, nuances. Yeah, so yeah. your point about the balance of the equity in terms of the commercial value of those artists, there's probably nuances that you can put into that. You know, mm. if, you're an, if you're a big artist and you're curating a show, put a nuance in there to say that you want to split that equally amongst mm -hmm. headliners and mm -hmm. tier two or tier three or whatever that looks like, and it's not just a pot that's for the last 10%. Mm. There you go. Mm. And on top of that, I think, there's so many layers to it because I think when it comes to actually getting those artists, it's ensuring when they get to the show that they are looked after, they are respected, and that as well as the money, but that they are treated right and that they That's are true. That's true. like make sure that they feel comfortable. Because there's been a lot of um, DJs saying they've come to a venue and someone was like, "You don't even look like you're the DJ," and there these go. things that happen, you and go. you know, are you really playing? Oh, do you do you play, actually play techno mm -hmm. and these things? And I think also like coming to spaces and battling those those other issues which come up with being in those spaces is so is so tricky as well on top of that mm. um and uh, like which kind of brings me on to even being um i think a really good uh place to take this conversation is even talking just about like the mental health implications of being like a minority and obviously in a white space it's like you know we're doing this talk but you know, I, like I said, I'm a regular here, I come to Unfold, but I'm also very conscious that I am one of only like one like black queer women in the space. And I feel safe coming to this, this, this club, like it's, it really is a home for me. Like it's, I'm, I've been partying for 13 years, I've never felt a community like I feel here. Um, but I'm still, like I said, again, aware of being a minority in the space. Like what kind of um, impact, I mean, you don't have to share, I don't, you don't have to go too deep into your own personal 
stories if you don't feel comfortable, but I would like to find out from you um, how you think we can improve that and what we can do to kind of, I don't know, make people feel like they can come to spaces because I know I have a lot of black friends who feel like specific, like certain events are just not for them. And, you know, sometimes people go, you're, but you're super confident, you just put yourself out there. And it's like, that is part of it. But also I go out for music and it's always been a massive driver for me. Like I've always been very music focused, like even going to Reading Festival, like going to like the lock up punk stage and just be like in the crowd. And it's always just been music led for me. So like what kind of, yeah, what kind of advice or encouragement would you give to other yeah, black people, POC, wanting to come to these spaces, but feeling like it's not for them? Like what would you, how would you encourage them to want to come? I guess to an unfold maybe, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> It's a tricky one because I feel like with this, the, again, there are so many layers. You kind of need to make sure that, like, from the bottom up, it is all geared towards like actual equality. Mm -hmm. I think my issue with the scene is like putting it out there. I'm quite disillusioned with the scene as a whole because yeah. I think like well, we've, we've been seeing each other out for like lot, years now. Yeah, yeah, a yeah, lot. Yeah, but I think a lot of venues and parties mm. pay a lot of lip service to saying we're a safe space. But one, no space can ever be like 100% safe. 100, 100. It's only safer spaces. So it's putting in place like protocols and various things to make sure people feel comfortable. And then on top of that, like being a person of colour or being someone queer in a space, it's very easy to get microaggressions. And like you can have people around who punters can go to if they feel uncomfortable, but it's impossible to make it 100% okay. So it's quite a hard one. Um, but I think when, you use the word community, I think when there is a genuine community and people are looking out for each other mm. and they are very aware of the space's values, mm -hmm. that really helps. Um, but then you spoke about like mental health impact. This is kind of like a different angle, but I think as a black performer or DJ or artist even, something I thought about quite a lot is, at least to me, it feels as if when you are trying to make a name for yourself, you kind of have to, maybe this is like a me thing, but I thought you kind of have to show yourself or prove yourself like mm. 10 times as much as other people to kind of battle accusations of tokenism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you need to prove that you are there for a reason, not, not just because of your skin color, maybe this is like a personal insecurity, but like so that you can kind of battle any accusations of you just being placed somewhere because you are black, because people get salty and they'll say, <laughs> oh, well, you're just on this lineup because you're black. Yeah. And you're like, actually, no, it's because I'm good. And you want your music to talk. There you so, go, yeah, you because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. yeah, there are all these values that we speak about, like love, peace and respect. Um, but you want, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it to be like about the music and what your output is saying. And we want to make space for people like us, but you also want to make it at the same time. So it's just the music. So it's, it's a tricky time mm -hmm. to walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting point, <laughs> the last one you made. Yeah. I, I, something I hadn't really thought about in depth, you know, like, do people look at us in this space in a way of, oh, they're only on it because they're black and she's a woman kind of thing. Yeah. But I think it's definitely important to nurture environments that are inviting for people. So when we put on BAD parties, from the get-go, we have tickets, like we have ally tickets versus tickets for everyone else. So from the, from the offset, you kind of know mm -hmm. who this space is for. When we throw our parties, the venue, I mean, we use black owned venues. We ensure, we hire in our own staff. All the staff are black from the door, security, bar, mm -hmm. guests, like everything. Um, and so I think it's really important, like if you're putting on these events or owning a space to, genuinely be invested in making sure people feel as comfortable as possible. Yeah. And if that means, you know, like getting rid of the venue staff and bringing in your own, training people, like, you know, what terminology are people using? Yeah. It's really, really like granular, but it's worth mm. it because at the end of the day, people will feel, will be so elated and happy in this yeah. space and will return because they know that they're in an environment that is for them. I think there's another issue though, that, it, which is quite unfortunate where like, and you mentioned earlier that black people don't feel like the space is theirs. And I think that's a deeper issue in terms of like dance music yeah. as an yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a whole yeah. that's, that's yeah. another conversation. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of black that. people, obviously not in our world because we are lucky enough to be, to be in, in a circle, yeah. which yeah, is diverse, true. black and queer people, because these are the two, for me, these are the two communities that it, it all started in. We're lucky enough to be around people like that. But there are a lot of black people that a, don't associate these this demographic mm -hmm. with dance music, therefore don't even attend yeah. venues yeah. and, and mm -hmm. parties. But I think 
it, I, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just very important that we are doing as much as we can to nurture spaces, educating people, you know, like, yeah, what terminology are you using? Who, who are we seeing? Like, who, the first person you see before you step in the club is the person at the door, and that basically is the beginning of your journey. If that interaction is negative, that affects the rest of your night. Yeah. So for me, yeah. if I see a black woman or a black queer person at the door, already I'm... Um, five steps. I'm here. Yeah. I'm here. So Let's get it. Let's just, get it popping. Yeah. No, literally. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Just from experience of putting on parties with BAD, any like we use Color Factory, one of the very few black-owned mm -hmm. venues in the city, and a lot of their staff, most of their staff are queer, anyways. But we always bring in black staff, and just from that's just like one practice and technique that we yeah. try to implement. I mean, I'm sure there's loads more, but mm. yeah, mm. as a starting point. Yeah, I mean, everything you guys have said is, is spot on. I guess I come from a background where my, my entry point into dance music was probably garage music because, like, I was growing up and thinking that this dance music was white music. Like, that was... I grew, out, I grew up outside of London. Like, I didn't really have a lot of interaction with black dance music. So my first, you know, interaction with it was garage music. Mm -hmm. And for, for that moment, I was like... Okay, this is this is by us. Firstly, this is by us, and then it gives you an opportunity to look back on where everything came from. And I think that you know something you spoke about in terms of that education piece. It's it's almost a reminder about where things come from and where things are nurtured. Like, firstly, I think that's an education piece that needs to continue to be told, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's told mm -hmm. enough to everybody. Um, I think what you spoke about in terms of like representation, obviously. When we see people that are delivering shows, that are DJing, yeah. that are performing, that are that look like us, the young ones coming up can see that they're performers that that look like them, then they feel like it's a space for them. You know, I think that's that's one thing. And what you guys are doing at Bad that sounds incredible because I feel like that's a mm. that's a real challenge also. But it's a challenge that if you really want to make it a safe space, you have to do. Mm -hmm. Like I I threw a lot of events in in Ibiza for many years, and there are various pitfalls with throwing a black party in Ibiza and one of them is security mm. and firstly the relationship bet between the security guard and the black person there's a culture difference there especially mm -hmm. when they are from Spain um, and also finding the black staff that you can actually put in those positions. They need to be able to speak Spanish. They need to have their security license, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So I think in all of these layers of representation, it's often a bit harder to get the mm -hmm. right representation, but we just have to work a bit harder mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah, I mean I, I mean, I believe those people are out there, like we're all sitting here together and it is a bit of a journey. I think when you're discovering this scene, discovering the music, um, I feel like what you talked about, the representation, or like seeing people yourself, even like seeing people like Nick's do it, and then Charles as well. And, you know, it's been so inspirational because I'm DJing, that's up and coming. And, you know, those, I, I remember a specific event where I went to, so I went Pickle Factory, Pickle Factory with Helena Star. I yeah. And I basically went, um, it was Josie Rebel curated night. And we went, because um, uh, we were on guest list, and so we went, and like literally it's Kay Hand is, is playing. Um, and I've seen so many like black men playing like Detroit techno, like, you know, DJ Stingray, Detroit in effect, that kind of thing. But seeing Kay Hand like on the deck to me was so, I don't know, I felt like it was like a life changing moment. It's like a like game it, changer. it was yeah. like, I was like, wow, like I've never seen a black woman playing Detroit techno. Like I was mm. like, okay, I was like, I can do that. Yeah. And that actually did give me the confidence to think, okay, I can put myself in this space. Mm -hmm. But I think unless you see that and you see more representation, and I think that's why, even for me personally, that's why I want to DJ, because I want other like black queer women to see me and be like, yeah, I can do that. Because mm -hmm. I think yeah. that needs to happen more and it doesn't happen enough. Um, I think, oh, do you want to? Yeah, no, I was going to say, I think yeah. it's quite, it's quite perverse, like in the way that like the roots, this is nourishing the roots. Yeah, like, no, yeah. The roots are super black, but like I feel until you like really dig into the history, you don't really realize that. And then like a lot of people of color are just like, oh, that's like white music. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, well, no, it's actually not when you look mm -hmm. at the history. Or it's like uns music. But sadly, like the crowds for the most part in Europe, like do reflect that. And I think until you can get more people in who kind of, are like willing to try it out or dip a toe in. Uh, 
through either seeing like people like them um, performing or just through sheer interest, I guess. Um, until that happens, like you won't really get people rising through the ranks. Um, and I think it's like a real issue. So it's like, how do you address that issue and like mm. kind of push more people through? Um, it's, it's happening. And I think there's like a real moment, like kind of around the world where like, in London, in New York, like Detroit, like all over. Yeah. Like, there even are more even um, Barcelona, they've got like a really sick collective called Joku Collective, JQ Collective, and they basically like a, like a all black electronic music collective, and they sick. curated um, like the Cooper stage, the Boiler Room Cooper yeah, stage yeah, at like yeah. Primavera. And before I went to that, like hey, this, that's where like, I saw you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. that's where we saw you. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, sweat, yeah, and yeah. I was like, yeah. yeah. And Karen, Karen Noyami was on, and KG mm. was on, and like. I had never heard of them until then, but it was amazing. And seeing like literally full black crew, mm. all like queer, like it was, it was yeah. vibes. And like yeah. when you come to spaces and like discover collectives like that, that is what gives me hope because I was like, I never knew that existed in Barcelona. They've been mm. running for a good couple of years mm. as well. So mm. those sorts, sorts of sorts of things, I think, are just like integral to keep keep it, to keep building what we're trying to do here. Um, I feel like as well, I'm going back to what you were saying about. Um, oh, what was it you mentioned about uh, the oh yeah the relationship with clubs and even um, venues that are black owned? Obviously, there's not that many black owned venues. Like I know you mentioned Color Factory because that's one of the only clubs I know that's black owned. I don't know if you know it's others. Color Factory, Prince of it's either Wales or Peckham. Yeah. Peckham. Maybe it's Peckham. black owned, Peckham. and there's another one. Which yeah. I can't remember. I think there's only three in London. Like, okay. That's crazy. For something yeah. so big. Well, like, I know, yeah. right? We're in London, and yeah. I like a, a conversation that I've been having and like realizing a lot more as like being more in club spaces are the lack of venues that actually want to host black events. Yep. Um, and kind of go, like, I guess it kind of goes back to what you were talking about with Abifa and like the cultural exchange, and also just the general, I guess, negative connotations that come with hosting black events anyway you know carnival yeah. every day you know there's always like this undertone of like it's black it's gonna be so there's gonna be trouble it's, 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 it's happened yeah. it's happened throughout history with pretty much every yeah. genre yeah. of music section 90 there's, every, there's, there's, there's a there's a point in time where a genre of music kind of gets stamped on mm. if there's if there's too much black energy that and comes through grime. that yeah. whether it's yeah. hip-hop yeah. or grime yeah, or true. garage all of that got stamped down at some point in time and didn't give you know, our culture time to flourish. Mm. And I feel like we, you know, I, I don't know whether it's, whether it was in the late eighties, there was a, there was a moment where it felt like, you mm. know, black people were really part of that. And it feels like there's something happening again now. And I don't know mm. whether it comes out of the mindset change that everybody's going through, but I do feel like there is a little bit more acceptance for black people to want to be in those spaces. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, I remember that there was like, oh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe like 10 years ago, but like the Form 696, which was used to like shut down basically like venue or club nights, which were like aggressive or could lead to danger, but it was used disproportionately against black events. Yeah, of course. Um, which is insane, but like also it makes sense, right? Um, in terms of it being like used like that. Um, but I think, as you said, like there seems to be like a pushback against that and people are more accepting. But something I've encountered through like my curational activities, like <laughs> when working with clubs and putting together lineups, yeah. obviously I need to think about the commercials. So they'll be like, who's big right now? And they'll list a bunch of white artists. And then in a non-racist way, but like maybe subconsciously, they'll be like, oh, well, you mentioned so-and-so black artists. They'll be like, they're not big enough. But I think, the crux of it is if a lot of venues are more adventurous, they'd realize people would come out for that. And through my personal experience, I've noticed the events where I have more black people playing, more people of color in the crowds, mm -hmm. just naturally. Mm -hmm. And like, True. it kind of filters through like that. So I think a lot of promoters and clubs need to kind of like venture out a bit more. And if they were less safe, they'd realize there is a space for this sort of stuff and there's an appetite for it. Yeah. So I think well, that's the, the, Going back to like the, the first question in, in mm. those riders, like it mm. pushes venues and promoters yeah. to be more risky with their there lineups and their curation, yeah. you know, yeah. so. And they realize it can be successful. Yeah. And like there isn't an issue in terms of commercial, commerciality, so yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think what you're saying about clubs kind of taking more of a risk, it's also, I guess post COVID as well, people take into that account of like, I don't know, they're trying to be, they're trying to be careful. But like you said, I think if people kind of break out or go beyond the boundaries and, and actually what you were saying about when the artist, the, the, the lineup is more, you know, diverse, you do see it in the crowd. I'm, I remember specifically going to um, uh, Estee Communi, which is like run oh, by Mara, I was saying Mara yeah. in, in Amsterdam, 
a couple like back in April, and it's like founded by Maron and I think Gills Gills is uh, another black a black um, Dutch Dutch guy. And like when you that, honestly, it was like one of the blackest like techno events I've been to ever. Yes. Um, yeah. Even though, like I was I was in New York in May, and then again I went like to like basement. It mostly it was like mostly like black queer lineup like Juliana Huxtable and like, like a, a couple other artists and. I don't know. I was going to say stateside. They seem to know over their their, their music. I don't know what, where the disconnect of like mm. Europe uh, mm. and like America is, but there were so many black people at that rave, and I was like, why is this not translating to the UK, really, like or to Europe? Like, what? Why do you think it's that really is? Really interesting. It's so okay, yeah. If you actually look at the timeline mm. in history, when techno was exported out of Detroit mm. in the eighties that's when it became an industry. Mm. It wasn't an industry before, it was a feeling, yeah. if you will. So when it was exported here, it was completely divorced from its roots and mm. it became an industry. Mm. Financialization, commercialization. So if you specifically looking at the United Kingdom and Western Europe, we are even, we are so disconnected because the way it was sold to us as a commodity, yeah. that's how we know it. Mm -hmm. So think of, 18 year olds now who are even more disconnected from the roots all they know it as is what it's been sold to them as how it's been packaged and sold because techno is now an industry it's a money-making thing mm -hmm. it's not what it was stateside now when you look at places like new york and mm. what people like dweller and frankie are doing mm -hmm. they are actually yeah. still on the continent where mm. it was shipped if you will mm. out of to us from so they still have a bit more of a connection to what it yeah. actually is in its traditional sense if you look at what drexia were trying to do mm. well not mm. trying to do what they were what doing they, yeah using their the music to depict like what techno is in what it was from its origins in like africa this you know these are the people in the us that were doing it so when it comes to UK and Western Europe, we are so divorced from the it, yeah. roots. It's actually shocking. It's, like, it, it's and shocking. We, we are actually lucky that we know as much as we do because yeah. the way it was exported over here and sold to a Western audience mm -hmm. as EDM, mm -hmm. as, a, as an industry, in the 80s, no one was calling this an industry. Mm -hmm. That was not a term. You wouldn't use these you know, business terms. It was literally just, you go into a warehouse, enjoy yourself yeah. and go home. <laughs> <Awesome moves. laughs> um, so I think yeah. we are so divorced from what it was. The way, what, the way that we have been sold techno is how it was intentionally sold to us because it wasn't an accident mm -hmm. that it was exported yeah. from Detroit at the same time um, the manufacturing, sorry, the driving uh, services was also being exported out of Detroit. It wasn't yeah. an accident that both things were being exported as an industry to be sold into this new Western audience, you know, look at festivals now, how much money they make from like a sound that this, that was not its intention yeah. at all. Yeah. So yeah, when we go back to your point of like, why in the UK are we so disconnected from its origins? It's because that's how it was sold to us yeah. intentionally. Yeah. It's yeah. also, I'd say, like the Berlinification, essentially. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean. cause it was around, it came from Detroit, and like we had the Summer of Love over here, and then it also went to Berlin, where obviously it naturally super white. But then that's kind of where it like germinated and grew even more and more. And like through that, it kind of, that's where the roots of the industry started. Um, and yeah, I just feel like there's a huge difference in the way it's been sold, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say it's like perfect in America, but they seem to be like more switched on in that sense. But it does seem as if we are like, slowly starting to like come around to it now. Mm. Like, they're, more, they're more switched on as well because I think from a like historical perspective, look at the way industrialization happened in countries such as the UK yeah. versus the US. The UK, one thing that I hate to say it, that mm. it does well <laughs> is like industrialization actually has a good structure. Mm. So it came into a country where there was a structure for it to be embedded in. Yeah. The US mm. doesn't have that. Um, so but that's actually worked well for techno because it means that you have more communities, more underground, you know, houses, warehouses for mm. people to like actually enjoy Those themselves. Parties, yeah. And it's not this money making, commercialization, commercialization yeah. financialization. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's, so, it's the deep. But, so so yeah. where, where does, where does the, where does the reconnection for was the my UK and the <laughs> Europe, right I'm sorry, like, because <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I feel like I, Kenny and I recently put on a party in, in Ibiza a couple of weeks ago. And we decided we want to curate the lineup, which felt like sonically black, but diverse in its genre. Yeah, nice. And 
I feel like there's some times where we get a little bit hung up on like what sonically right for the for the night yeah. and mm. and and sometimes different genres and different sounds can actually work really well together and they mm. can feel you know intuitively black yeah, and i think that some of those parties you know in new york and chicago and you go to them and it's electronic music it feels like innately black the sound and the mm. soul in it Mm. And we were, you know, we had Jules play alongside Seth Troxler. Sonically, you wouldn't ever imagine that happening, <laughs> but the vibe was incredible and it really encouraged a really great, diverse and black audience. So I don't know, I feel, feel like there's more risk taking that we can be made by mm. curators sometimes to, to weave in the blackness to continue to educate the audiences that are there. Yeah, I mean, I know there's been a big conversation as well, but you know, even at the MOBO Awards, the fact they don't have a lot of, you know, they don't have electronic music categories anymore and it, if we did those like kind of made more of a reconnection with our like black roots in i guess the mainstream i mm. guess then it would be more kind of seen as as black black music but then it's still this thing where it's kind of like pushed to the side and still seen as white which is unfortunate yeah, it's it's always so called like always called yeah. like afro house or it's yeah. called like af tribal house yeah. 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 It's, like, yeah. it's like they have to then give it a def definitive name yeah. that you can own that piece of it yeah. but you can't own the whole piece you yeah know? for sure um i feel like um even talk even when i like learned about um electronic music being connected to black people like i think it was what, like quite late and i even i was like whoa okay i can actually own this because i've been going out to raves and my dad's like why are you going to yeah, these like yeah. raves like going to these techno parties and like people just not getting it and i feel like once you find out about that it just changes your whole Absolutely. perspective it, like it just changes your world and it makes you feel more I don't know, it feels, make, makes you feel more solid in owning mm. it and being in the space and mm. taking up space. Um, and I just always feel like I want to meet people and just be like, look, just take up space. So whenever I see whenever I see any black people in the club, I'm always like, yo, connect, let's, it's good to see you. Because I know, I feel like I know as well how much like energy and maybe encourage even it's taken to put your foot yeah. into the space, you know, and, and, still, and still own it and enjoy it. Um, but I think everyone just like, yeah, needs to, you know, once in a while, just take a friend, like get them to dip their toe in yeah. the pool and I think they'll be fine. <laughs> so we've been talking about how, you know, whilst it's great that we're seeing more diverse lineups, um, how do we ensure as well that that's carrying through to the audiences? And I know yourself, Nick and Charles, you're both DJs. I just wanted to get your perspective on what that's been like for you playing to audiences, especially as I know sometimes you're playing to white majority of audiences. And I just want to get your feelings on, on that in itself. Hmm, how do I feel about playing to white majority audiences? Do you know, sometimes it's like, okay, cool, I get it. Like, I'll be playing in certain cities and certain clubs that I know what they're about, what they attract and call cool, whatever, it is what it is. Of course, it would be nice to play to more people, to my people. It would be great to play to my people. Yeah. I think it's, it can be, you know, quite disheartening sometimes, especially like when it's like a younger demographic and I, I generally think, do they know what like, is going on here? Like, do they know what they're part of? I'm, I'm not sure, like I'm thinking about it deeper, but I think it's important to say if we can as venues make our spaces more attractive to like diverse, um, to diverse communities, it's, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one because there are obviously some promoters that I play for that have that. So um, there's a really great queer party in Manchester that I play for. And when I play for them, I'm not even just queer, the, 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 the shades of skin that I see, it's the most diverse. Um, so it is down to like who the promoter is. That's really important, like who are they following? But I do think that we're still there's still a long way to go there because there are just a lot of venues and especially the bigger parties, as we spoke about earlier, mm. money-making things. Yeah. They're just selling, unfortunately, to uh, pretty... Uh, I don't want to offend. To like, <laughs> you know, people aren't as knowledgeable as we are, let's yeah, just say. Yeah, I hate you. you know, people buy tickets based on one or two names and these are a younger demographic of people and there's actually quite a big difference between the UK and Europe, which is something we talk a lot about offline. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think though, like the audience thing, there's still a long way to go because how do you, and it's, it's part of this whole re-education piece and education piece. Um, at the end of the day, people want to sell tickets and make money. 
that's their primary goal. And the people that are buying those tickets are like a younger white English crowd, mm -hmm. essentially. Mm. Um, so it's very, I feel very fortunate when I get invited to play like the small, the smaller parties where they are specifically tailoring it to an audience. And you're just like, I'm in a room with my people. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one. But from the, from behind the booth, like it's something I do notice. I notice hard and I have to really sometimes not allow it to consume me. But I do think quite profoundly about things. And that's when I really realise, oh, this is just an industry mm -hmm. that people just yeah. want to make money. Mm -hmm. That's all it is for a lot of people. It's just making money. And if this is the audience they can sell tickets to, then that's it. And without being cynical, but that is quite literally what it is yeah. for some for a lot of people. But there yeah. is a difference between the UK and Europe, I have to say. The Europeans are doing something that we're not we haven't quite caught on to. Mm. Um I would agree to be honest. Whether it's to do with like the later licensing, the 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 culture around the substances out, yes. around the purpose. Like mm. the openness maybe or? I think like it's just a yeah, fairness. I mean yeah, if if we're, not, if we're not even talking about the skin colour or mm. sexuality, just the level of maturity that there is around going out, going out and Attitude, engagement. Yeah. And with that, then I find there's more diversification That's across really the board, regardless of whether it's skin age tone. Age as well, and age. That's age, really good point. That's just like the mentality. The yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, from a DJ perspective, I am still DJing to far too many white people. And it's something I do notice. Mm. And I'm not really sure. I'm actually not really sure what mm. I, 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 the only onus I can really put it on is like the promoter. But at the end of the day, we've just come out of a pandemic. Pe tickets aren't selling for so many people. Look how many festivals and events have been cancelled because That's of this. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people's priority is just to sell tickets. And when you look at the, the larger ones and look at their demographic, it is a younger, it's a younger like, I don't even know what word to use that isn't offensive. It's just a younger, <laughs> um, less educated into what they're engaging with crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah that's I the nicest you. way to put it. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. think I get... <laughs> like, no, 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 I, Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'd say there's like two prongs to it. So like, I, largely it's the responsibility of the promoter. Like, we've spoken about them being responsible. I think you're right, we've come out of a pandemic, people need to make money, but it's like shifting the models. Like maybe you don't do these like massive several thousand people events, but you maybe like scale it down a bit, but make your lineups more talk, interesting. During, during lockdown, there was a lot of talking about using more local artists, not using massive artists. There was all this conversation, artists. where's that happened? And then happen? posting posts, yeah. was like, no, like, right, headliners, headliners. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the issue with that is, yeah. I think, because we've come out of the pandemic and we know ticket sales have not been great, like the live space has, gone down, Tips, yeah. what is happening is like the complete opposite where you just have the ones that monopolize, mm -hmm, monopolizing mm -hmm, even more. Mm -hmm. And then unless you're a small one who has some sort of secure, crowd, yeah, yeah. lower crowd or some sort of five year grant, you know, where you're receiving, you just fall in through the cracks, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 It, li it literally is nourishing the roots though. It's yeah. literally, it's building community from a localized position because, yeah. you know, that commodifying aspect mm. is, is large scale. Mm. You and, yeah. Yeah. you know, promoters aren't making money at the moment either. So the easiest thing for them to do is to check who is the biggest selling mm -hmm. and who's selling the most tickets and, sense, yeah. and, we'll, and we'll book that show. Mm -hmm. But Thanks. there yeah. needs to be a little bit of going back to the community element yeah. and doing building small parties, up. building yeah. people exactly. up. Yeah. Some of the best, you know, I feel like some of the best, maybe not electronic parties, but some of the best attended black parties in the city at the moment are parties that have resident DJs on them, that have DJs that aren't like huge headliners, but they've built them from a community base. So we'll play a way more interesting set than yeah, like exactly. so-and-so big DJs. And, DJ, I, and yeah. I, think that's a, I think that's a lot of how, that's a lot of how I feel like business and, you know, Ethic should be built. It's from a it's from a ground point. Yeah. It's from yeah, a like community. The yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, there's a there's a connection with the promoter, the owner, and their crowd, mm -hmm. which we, that you don't see on the three four thousand capacity venues. You know, yeah. and I think that's that's why the crowds are not as connected. And that leads really nicely into something I was going to say because yeah, it's the responsibility of the promoter and their crowds. But then I think kind of divorcing it from the dance floor and through things like this, through right. like panels, through like getting people to actually like engage with this stuff. Mm. And that might mean getting creative with the way that you like talk to your audience yeah. or educate them mm. or even educate people who aren't part of your audience. Mm. Um, but by doing that, you then like end up bringing in people who may not have been interested in it, but then we'll see that, oh wow, this actually is for me. So I think stuff like this is like really important. And in my opinion, and this is why I said I was getting disillusioned because 
after years of hard work and doing all this stuff, still going to events yeah. and still seeing like five white male DJs playing and you're like, are you for real? Like all that stuff we were talking about, what was the point? To be honest, actually, one festival that I did go to and I give, can give massive props to um, was Maiden Voyage and mm. they had like underground resistance. Like that, yeah. that was like a music festival for the heads. Yeah. Mm. I and, was, and, and didn't you think the lineup was so also, diverse as well? Yeah, right? like, they had like, I didn't even clock this. Someone said to me, they were like, you realise that like, all the headliners are black. It was like Sherelle was on. Yeah. It was like, JJ. Yeah. yeah, underground like, resistance yeah, 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 yeah. for and Jeff Mills. Jeff Mills, yeah. I was like, yeah. stop. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I, was like, yeah. I, was like who, I don't know who organised that festival, but I Tash LC. Yeah. That festival yeah, yeah. was yeah. just like, I beyond me. And I, I was, was like, big scale, we, but it was, yeah, it's I, possible. And that's the thing. And I, in my head, like, there was, you know, underground resistance has drew in such a massive crowd. Yeah, of yeah, and yeah. even floor plan, and people are getting educated and learning. And I'm like, literally, these are the people the that made the music. And like you said, I think it is like, like, about promoters, organisers taking more risk. And I think so many people have so much good feedback to say about that festival. And mm. honestly, even going to a festival like that in the UK, in London, I was like, mind blown. It yeah, honestly was agree. a pleasure. And, and it, but it would be great to see those type of festivals coming back. More, yeah. Because sure. the, the, the issue that promoters have is you might take a risk, but you might not be able to make enough to see it again, mm. you know? Mm. And, and I feel like that's why it, it, it needs to start on that small scale and it needs to mm. grow from there. Like a very organic, organic very way. It's way. easy to yeah. say that because yeah. it takes time and a lot of people, yeah, yeah. you know, they don't I'm have the not time. not willing to, yeah, you know? of course. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's also like who's governing the countries. Music, yeah, yeah. arts and culture in a lot of European countries is taken, is highly regarded. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Money is invested yeah. in these places like Germany. It's like a cultural it's institution. Form. It's an yeah. art form. Yeah. So yeah. when you're saying, you, your club opens at midnight Saturday and starts Monday morning, you're going to make money. So if you're going back to the point of people saying, oh, but it's a risk, open your clubs yeah, for two yeah. days. People will buy well, tickets, well, spend yeah, on drink. Did it. So it's like a women's situation, but also it means that the people who are consuming the or engaging with the industry or the culture are like invested in it for the right reasons, for the right purposes. Yeah. And then hopefully that would then invite a maybe more alienated black community into these spaces where it's True. not just about getting mash up, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's about so, like engaging with the, with other people. When you go to Bergheim, if you're not dancing, you're talking to people, you're, so you're, you're speaking you to people, you're making, making friendships, you're, you know, you're literally building the community in yeah, a club. Exactly, you're yeah. literally, you have the time. You have yeah. the time. <laughs> and yeah. this is why people go back to these institutions it's and true. you're reinvesting exactly. monetarily, but also your time, your energy. So if other countries took a leaf out of these books, it would really, there would be a serious cultural Transform. shift and it would just be so much more inclusive for so many more communities and yeah. groups of people. Well, that's, that's how it started, right? You know, if you yeah. think about the, the absolute roots of yeah. the culture and the, and the communities that they came out of, it, it was DIY, yeah. it there was unpoliced, yeah. it was uncommodified. Yeah. And as soon as we make it commodified and we set these yeah. boundaries and this is the start and this is the end, mm. you know, like it, it, it loses some mm. of its soul. And I yeah. feel like that's mm. what a lot of black people feel like. It, it's lost the soul, yeah. mm. you know? I mean, some final thoughts I would say, in terms of obviously the, the panel's called Nourishing the Roots, mm. and we spoke about things that we feel like would do that, about building build community, um, go, yeah, going back to what, like, focus on, refocusing on the dance floor, are there any other things that you feel like would do that uh, for the people? So I would say, I kind of mentioned it very briefly, but it feels like things have been like quite segregated. Like mm. people go to like Afrobeats nights or like drill nights or R&B mm. nights or whatever, and that's like predominantly black. And the electronic nights are seen as white. You'll see it kind of start to shift now, but I think it's like, this is why I go back to kind of moving it away from the dance floor and like educating people just separately. And through things like that, kind of getting people to be aware, because then they'll be like, oh, wow, maybe this actually is for me. Mm -hmm. And that combined with visibility and like just seeing more people like you involved in that kind of leads to greater participation. So I think if there's more of that, then people will kind of be more willing to get involved, along with a kind of shift of perception, both on like a country level, but also like the way these different groups look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that could help just like integrate a lot more, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a, like an artist perception like you guys do, but just thinking about like being a promoter in London um, and, you know, the number of black promoters that are in the electronic music scene, you know, I feel like there's underrepresentation there. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, why, why is that? You know, it's probably for a lot of the reasons that, that we've spoken said. about yeah. Al yeah. already, yeah. you know, like yeah. having that kind of like journey onto the dance floor. But, yeah, yeah. you know, I feel like there needs to be 
There needs to be more venues that are willing to take a risk on black promoters. You know, I feel like that's something that will give an opportunity for these promoters to curate the lineups, to bring their crowds, because, you know, a lot of promoters that start out, they're filling their party with their friends, right? You know, it's not mm -hmm. necessarily just their lineup, they're filling yeah. their party with their community. And if mm -hmm. that community starts with them, then maybe there just needs to be more spaces for these promoters to thrive. Mm. Um, I think ownership is like a really big thing for me like to all the points that we're making you know why they're not as many black promoters or people in the dance floor i feel like unless behind the scenes the actual structures and people that monopolize it mm -hmm. aren't reflective of that then that trickle down effect won't happen or will take longer to happen yeah. so for me if we're talking about nourishing the roots currently the people who are behind the scenes running owning the scene are not from on the origins of yeah. the roots yeah. so that needs to change who who are owning the clubs who are owning the venues who's the head programmer who owns all the big editorial platforms that promote and choose which venues going to, event, events going to be listed number one you know all of that is impacts it all so yeah. ownership 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 is something that i talk about a lot yeah. i could that's like a whole topic in itself yeah. Yeah. but i really do believe that until the the correct people own these entities and it's like you know these are the people behind the scenes that we don't hear or see they're the ones that have all the money pulling the strings yeah, yeah that's what yeah, it is you know yeah. they're the ones that we need to really have our eyes on mm. um so it's great dj lineups have changed wicked but like is the person making money from that what do they look like ownership's really important uh, so yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, predominantly behind the scenes, it's overwhelmingly white. Um, you have a lot of collectives making the way through, such as BAD, uh, Shannon SP and her Nine Nights Collective, uh, a lot of other things. Uh, I think something that has been the case throughout history um, in terms of ownership, in terms of like creating autonomous organisations, it's always been on people of colour to kind of shoulder the burden. Uh, and we have made our way through mm. like relentlessly, and we always will. Uh, I think ultimately with these like gatekeepers, ultimately, if they work in tandem with these institutions and organizations, that's how they gain visibility. Mm. And through doing so, that kind of filters down to behind the scenes. So I think, as you say, these like journalistic organizations, a lot of these institutions, a lot of these venues, predominantly white, but if there are like good people behind them who want to like platform minorities, mm. I think if they work hand in hand, that can then lead to like actual deeper roots being grown in the end. Um, I'd love to hear about your projects you've got going on. Black Music Summit, especially Jordan, is quite new, so it'd be great if you could give the audience a bit more information on that. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, yeah, it's been a journey that we've been on for about uh, oh, just over a year or so. Um, yeah, and I think there's probably like some um, crossed periods with you guys setting up bad and just a bit of a mindset change, like us trying to have purpose in the work that we do. Um, I bet I an amazing person called Kenny Ishinloku, who, yeah, who, yeah, yeah. who you, know, you know well. Um, we're putting together a summit that's going to be taking place in Ibiza next year, all centred around the black music experience. So whether you are a black executive, you're a fan of black music, or you're looking to get into the music industry in some way, this is a space for you. Um, yeah, there's going to be live performances, going to be panel discussions. I'd love you guys to be More there. Back to, like, back to Jules and Seth Trucks there, yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And really just a celebration of black music and, and, a, and, a, and a place for us to really develop black talent. Oh, Nick? That sounds exciting. It does. I, yeah. I, I already yeah. saw that. I'm I will be there. You're Kenny has out. already sent me my invite. <laughs> yeah. I'll be there. I feel like you should help us curate some panels. I will definitely oh, yeah. help yeah. you. Yeah. Been, that's one of my expertise. There so, you yeah. go. Um, I guess BAD, we're now, what, two and a half years yeah. into what just feels like, wow, because <laughs> so much has happened um, in that time. And we've just, we've grown. Look, we just got back from ADE, myself and Sheryl did a talk. I delivered like a, every day is a good day to support and buy from black artists talk. And as we move into 2023, there are a lot of macro scale, let's say, um, activities we're gonna be working on, really on a global scale, working in different parts of the world where there's our community. Aren't you doing a tour? Like you were doing, a, I saw there was a, like a tour. Maybe. A BAD tour thing. And you were going to be in like Berlin. We, in like, no, that's um, Refuge Worldwide. But oh, we're, okay. we're working with them on a tour for the rest of this year. Okay, so cool. November, Corsica Studios, Roscoe's going to deliver a DJ workshop. Amazing. Roscoe, one of our favourite UK funky he's heroes. Sick. From, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So he's going to be delivering a DJ workshop. And then himself, Shannon SP, Sharice C, who you spoke on a panel with last at week at ADE. ADE. Yep. 
there's a whole great lineup wow. essentially. It's spicy. But yeah, we're wrapping up the year kind of with that event and a couple of activations, one including Elijah. But for 2023, it's about kind of the larger scale stuff because what we've recognised is we grew on a global scale. So we've got, I guess, a community base beyond just the UK and Europe. So we really want to tap into that as much as we can, mm -hmm. um, whether it be through talks, panels, workshops, events, other activations. There is one exciting thing that we're doing next year with a partner that I'm really looking forward to. Um, and essentially just as much of giving back to the community as we can, free and accessible, free and accessible. There are two things. What can we do and offer that is free and accessible, free and accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're basically going to try and do on a Global scale. Nice. Um, so any emails that you need to send to them now because the response rate might be quite <laughs> international. <laughs> so because it's a lot, you know, it's essentially myself and Kay with like then a global team who support us on project by project basis. Um, so yeah, you're also going to be doing something for us this year. I am. So yeah, <laughs> it's exciting. Ooh, it's exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. And Charles, you want to hear about what you're up to? Yep. So in a bit of an interesting period with Unbound. So as I say, it's been five years now. Um, alongside it, I've been working my day job uh, mm. as a lawyer. I'll say that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so the events have been on pause since July this year. Um, but going to 2023, from the start, I've always said it's about more than the events, it's about more than the music. Mm. Uh, so at the start of next year, I will be on a podcast called Back to Life um, that has previously had people such as Eris Drew. Um, I think Sarah Kin is taking part as well. Uh, and that is a podcast uh, about mental health and the industry, which is a topic very dear to my heart. Um, also, I'm looking to mid next year launch in-person panels um, talking about a variety of topics. So race being part of it, but also like wider social issues as well. And there'll be in-person events where people can come and we'll have a live audience with a QA and a aspect. Uh, and also on top of that, uh, I'm also launching a video series, uh, not stealing your idea, don't worry, um, but Ooh. where we'll be getting um, <laughs> DJs, predominantly friends, to be honest, uh, and we'll chat about the general approach, uh, the way they see things and just having a chat whilst doing quite a fun activity, which I will not reveal now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And that will start filming probably spring next year. Also, haven't you got residency recently on the lot, New York? It wasn't video? residency, I was just on oh, it. Oh, okay, but okay. we will also be doing more collaborations further afield. So nice. as was said, uh, I was at ADE uh, this year, which went surprisingly really well. Uh, so I'll be curating a panel next year, um, all black, don't worry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And just trying to move further afield, so like reaching more globally, uh, moving outside of just London. Yeah, there you go. Um, I just want to say a massive thank you for joining me. Jordan, Nick, Charles, this has been such an amazing panel. I feel like we definitely got into some of the roots and back out again. And I hope that we can keep this, you know, keep this conversation ongoing. Like I said, I don't feel like this needs to be something that's kept within the, in the confines of Black History Month. And I think this is a conversation that as long as we keep having and keep it pushing, keep it going, it will never go away. I will make people so annoyed that they'll just hate us until it becomes normal and we're just here. And we don't even have to talk about inclus like inclusivity, diversity riders. It's just happening. And we'll see you next time for the next Fold Talks. Okay. See. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank you everyone.